Okay, good evening everybody. This is Larry Walters again from Orlando, Florida. Welcome you to tonight's webinar, Understanding the Fair Tax. And uh, before we get started, I wish to remind you that everybody who logs in tonight will have the uh, microphones or telephones muted, so background noise from your area will not interfere with the presentation. If you have a question that you would like to either type into us or that you would like to ask us verbally, <coughs> If you have the microphone, go to your name, uh, click the question, the hand, raised hand, and that will let us know that you uh, have a question you wish to ask verbally. If you want to enter a question, you can type it into the question box, which is on your panel, and then click the question mark, and that will let us know that there is a question that has been posted. And when we come up to the Q&A period, we will uh, answer those questions. <clears throat> now, unlike the past seven webinars for the last eight years, in fact, uh, our special guest tonight, Kerry, doesn't know it, but he is wrapping up our eighth year of doing these Understanding the Fair Tax webinars, at least one a month. And uh, we're, we're excited about going into year nine in April. So to get things started, uh, we're going to turn control this over to our special presenta presenter, presenter tonight, getting tongue-tied here, uh, Kerry Bowers, who is a longtime advocate for the fair tax out of Nevada now. He used to be up here in the panhandle of Florida. Terry, welcome to Understanding the Fair Tax, and thank you so much for pitching in tonight. Well, thank you, Larry, and uh, thank you uh, also to Mark for giving me this opportunity uh, to join you this evening, and we're glad to have uh, everyone on board that has joined us find tonight, uh, I think you're going to find tonight to be a kind of a different sort of webinar from what we've had in the past because of the topic that we're going to engage on. Uh, and this particular topic is coming up at a very appropriate time considering that we're just finishing up the 2016 tax season and folks are starting to focus on paying their taxes before that April 15th uh, deadline. And also appropriate too because we have uh, Congress and the President uh, very much focused on tax reform, which they promise they will get to uh, as soon as they can get health care uh, under control as far as where we're going to be headed in the next direction for that. Now, the program I'm going to be presenting to you tonight is one that has been put together specifically identifying some of the major things that we've been able to find specific to President Trump's tax reform plan, as well as that of Congress. And it, uh, as you'll see as we go through here, we're going to compare that with the fair tax. And, and without further ado, we'll get started. And Larry, it looks like I don't want to advance right now for some reason. Let's see if I can regain. There we go. First of all, we're going to have some presentation objectives. The first objective for this evening is to introduce the principal components of President Trump's and Congress's tax reform plans and the People's Tax Replacement Plan. Notice I use the word replacement there when we're talking about the fair tax versus reform. Using the seven tax effectiveness features uh, as we get through our introductions of each one of the reform and replacement plans, we'll identify which one of those reform or replacement plans best achieves each of the seven tax effectiveness features. And then lastly, I, I hope to be able to, in the course of this evening, be able to motivate you to engage the President and Congress uh, to pursue the implementation of a tax system that is not just better, but one that is best for every American and our nation. Very briefly, a couple of comments about President Trump's tax reform plan. First of all, we find that since he came on board as a presidential candidate, it's been pretty much constantly under revision. So it's kind of hard sometimes to nail down exactly where the president is at any one moment. In fact, when I was running for Congress, as well as the president prior before that, uh, people would ask me, well, what do you think of the president uh, or, or uh, Mr. Trump's plan at that point? And I would look at my watch and say, well, if it's been more than an hour, then it's, it's possibly changed. So it's really hard to say where we are at to make some sort of a comment. But one of the things that we do know, as he has uh, become the president now, he does appear to be aligning more with Congress's tax reform plan. So let's look a little bit about where Congress has come uh, to, a, to the point that they have reached today in identifying a specific reform plan. 
Last year, in uh, 2016, House Speaker Ryan established six task forces that were made up of members of the various committees within the House of Representatives. And of these six task forces, they were assigned to look at six different areas uh, that the speaker identified for. One of those was the Constitution and how well our government was complying with the Constitution. Next was economy, health care, which we're very much focused on right now, national security, poverty, and what we want to be addressing tonight, tax reform. Now, one of the things that they did was, in, in the case of Speaker Ryan, was each one of these he placed under an umbrella that he called a better way our vision for a confident America. So he uses a single title, and there you can see it at the top of my slide now, A Better Way, Our Vision for a Confident America. And depending upon which of those six you go to look at, maybe you're researching online, you gotta make sure what, what it's identifying, is it specific to tax reform the Constitution, or maybe his overall better way plan, uh, which addresses all of those. Well, in June of 2016, just this past June, the Task Force on Tax Reform then released their tax reform, which they identify as a blueprint. And this blueprint is actually a product of the House Committee on Ways and Means within the House of Representatives, which is chaired by uh, Kevin Brady, who is also a, a former co-sponsor of the Fair Tax. Now, Speaker Ryan had a specific charge to the Task Force on Tax Reform, and that was to produce a plan that would, and I quote, create jobs, grow the economy, and raise wages by reducing rates, removing special interest carve-outs, and making our broken code simpler and fairer. You know, when we look at those words right there, reducing rates and making our broken code simpler and fairer, that's already given us an underlying indication of where Speaker Ryan wanted the House Ways and Means Committee to go. In fact, Speaker Ryan, when he was chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, had put out his own tax reform plan that included yet another uh, bracketed marginal, marginal income tax system. Now, the Task Force on Tax Reform, uh, again led by House Ways and Means Chairman Kevin Brady, uh, they identified three specific goals then for their blueprint to achieve. The first of that was to fuel job creation and deliver opportunity for all Americans. That's a pretty sound goal, I would think. Simplify the broken tax code and make it fairer and less burdensome. Well, right there we see that we're really probably not going to replace anything, but we're looking at massaging the current code in order to get it down to some simplified uh, method for everyone to be able to understand possibly a little better. And then number three, transform the broken IRS into an agency focused on customer service. So we can see from that third goal of the tax reform uh, task force that there was no intent to eliminate the Internal Revenue Service. Now, one of the things that I found very interesting when I read the Better Way Plan, and by, by the way, the Better Way Plan for the tax reform, it's only 34 pages long. And I'll tell you at the end of this presentation where you can go read that, although you can just Google a better way for tax reform and you'll find it. But one of the things that they did, and very interestingly so, was while, as we'll see, the uh, task force continued to focus in the direction of an income-based tax system. They included expert opinion quotes within their own blueprint that were contrary to having an income-based tax system. And as you'll see when I go through these quotes, they were more focused on a consumption-based system. So one of the first things that was said was a consumption-based tax, uh, excuse me, consumption-based tax systems are widely regarded to be more pro-growth than income-based tax systems like the current tax code. Another quote, an income tax includes saving in the tax base and thus penalizes saving, whereas a consumption-based system, as the name suggests, taxes only what is consumed, not what is saved. As a result, income-based systems discourage savings and investment, which means slower capital accumulation, lower productivity, and therefore slower economic growth. So in those first three statements, we already see that an income-based system, according to the experts, is inferior to a consumption-based system. But we still have a couple more that were put into the blueprint that I think were worth pulling out and sharing with you. One of those was it 
this statement, substantial empirical evidence shows that moving more in the direction of a consumption of consumption taxation would have significant economic benefits. And that's what we need today is significant economic benefits. And then there was this final one that I pulled out to share with you tonight. They said economists at the OECD, which stands for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and elsewhere have identified the corporate income tax as the most harmful of all forms of taxation in terms of the adverse effect on growth. Well, there's reason enough right there to get rid of all corporate taxes uh, when we're finding not just the OECD, but other individuals, other experts have pointed out that corporate taxes are going to adversely affect uh, your, your national growth, your economic growth. Well, given these things, these goals, as well as the expert opinion, what did Congress recommend? Well, I kind of put it in this wording. They recommended transitioning the current income-based tax system, one consistent, or excuse me, one consequential to the 16th Amendment and inclusive of income taxes, payroll taxes, and corporate taxes, all administered and enforced by the IRS to an income-based tax system, one consequential to the 16th Amendment and inclusive of income taxes, payroll taxes, and corporate taxes, all to be administered and enforced by the IRS. So as you can see, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what we have done is we really massaged a little bit of the current system, and we'll see more of that in just a moment, but we've essentially taken the basics of the current system and transition that into this new tax reform system where we have all the same uh, fundamental elements. Let's take a look, uh, starting with the President and Congress's tax reform plans and looking specifically at individual taxes and how individuals are impacted. First of all, for President Trump, he's identified 12, excuse me, he's identified three tax brackets, 12%, 25%, and 33%. And he wants to eliminate what's called the net investment income tax, which is an additional tax on higher income earners. And that's a 3.8% tax. One of the things he would do is eliminate the head of household bracket that we've been used to seeing so many years, single, head of household, married, and that sort of thing uh, when you file. And you can see how it's broken down in terms of the 12%, the 25%, the 33%, where it stands for dollar figures of income, whether you're single or whether you're married. Now, if we look at interest income, he was saying that we will tax it as ordinary income. So you'll just take whatever you get in interest, roll it in with your earned income, and you'll be taxed at that same 12, 25, and 33%. Capital gains and dividends will be based on your income bracket. So if you earn capital gains and dividends, if you're in the 12% bracket, they will have it a formula-driven process such that you'll pay 0% on capital gains and dividends. And you can see how it goes for 25 and 33%, essentially reducing uh, the rates uh, for your capital gains and dividends. Congress also has now, interestingly enough, the same brackets that came out in their Better Way Plan, a 12%, a 25%, and a 33%. Sometimes they like to say there's four brackets. If you don't uh, make enough to exceed the deductions that we'll see here in a moment, well, you can have a 0% bracket because you're not paying any income taxes. Congress's plan as far as interest, dividends, and capital gains go is that you will take one half of the amount that you've earned in dividends, interest, or capital gains, and then you'll be taxed on that at your ordinary rate. So it essentially cuts uh, the taxes on those by half, depending upon what tax bracket you happen to be in. Now, if we look at individual deductions and exemptions, we'll find that President Trump has a greater standard deduction, 15000 for single, 30000 for married. His itemized deductions would be capped, though, 100000 single, 200000 married. Personal exemptions he would eliminate because of the larger standard deduction, and child care deductions would be based on, uh, this must be some sort of formula-driven process, but they say on state average costs, but you will have a phase-out where your income as a single person is at $250,000, or if you're married, $500,000, you'd have those phased out. Congress's plan is to have standard deductions as well. So we've got a 12,000 for single, 18,000 for single with child, and 24,000 for married. 
they would still have itemized deductions. And those itemized deductions are saying right now, for the most part, under the congressional plan would be only for mortgage and charity contributions. Personal exemptions because of the larger standard deduction would then be eliminated. If we look at individual credits, benefits, and incentives, we see that President Trump would keep the earned income tax credit. This is something I'm very much against because I think it mixes too much of an expenditure program with uh, our tax revenue program. And a lot of people don't realize that when we're talking about earned income tax credit, an individual can actually get back more money under the earned income tax credit than they pay in both income taxes and in payroll taxes. Well, that creates a double entitlement for them and that they're getting back more money than they're actually paying in. But at the same time, they're receiving a Social Security benefit credit for future benefits on the income that they did make. So that when they go to draw Social Security benefits in later years, they'll be getting benefits on money that they actually never paid into the system uh, from an individual point of view. This puts a double liability then uh, on uh, Social Security today because there's the money's not going in for Social Security. Uh, from the employee share, uh, and it creates a liability then in the future because since that money wasn't put in and yet that person that got EITC is getting a benefit out, then there's less money available for those that did pay into the system all along. Now, President Trump also looks to have a low income child care credit of up to $1,200. And then savings accounts, he talks about with a benefit, uh, excuse me, a 50% benefit matching for children, elderly parents, and education. But that hasn't been well defined yet as to what that would be capped at, how much the government, uh, in other words, would be willing to contribute to a savings account that somebody else is adding to. Congress also proposes keeping the earned income tax credit. They're looking at a child credit uh, per child of $1,500, $1,000 refundable. Now, when you see the words refundable and non-refundable, what refundable means is if a person had uh, no income taxes due, but yet they had this child tax credit, they could still receive refundable $1,000 yet in a return, not a refund because they're not paying anything, but they can get $1,000 uh, provided to them per child. If we go down to the non-child dependent credit, we see that there's $500, but it's non-refundable. So you gotta still be paying something in order to have that reduced by this credit for a non-child of $500. So that's the difference between a refundable and a non-refundable. Uh, Congress also proposes higher education credits for low to middle income. They propose higher education and vocational training incentives, undefined what those would be. And then they would continue with retirement savings accounts. Again, not specifically identifying those, but we can uh, probably assume that it'd still be along the lines of your uh, IRAs and your 401 plans and things like that. Other individual taxes as proposed by President Trump, the alternative minimum tax, he would eliminate that. Estate taxes, he would eliminate those with the exception of, there was a comment in there talking about capital gains tax for estates over $10 million. There may still be some taxes uh, that would be applicable there. So it might not be a total repeal of all estate taxes. Gift taxes, he says he would repeal all of those. Congress, uh, the alternative minimum tax, they would also repeal. The estate taxes would be repealed. But there's some uh, generation skipping taxes out there too uh, that apply today, which is where you may have an estate where monies are left, not just to the child, but to the grandchildren or other family members outside the range of the child uh, that you may have taxes on today. Those would be repealed under the Congress's plan. Uh, gift taxes, he, they do not specifically address that they would eliminate all gift taxes uh, in the better way plan that Congress has produced. So we're going to assume that gift taxes uh, will in fact remain. Uh, what the limit will be is yet to be addressed. Uh, one of the things that neither President Trump or the Congress have addressed is payroll taxes. Payroll taxes are those taxes that we pay uh, through our earned income uh, for Social Security and Medicare. And it's important, I think, that, that those are highlighted and noted because most people pay more in payroll taxes than they actually pay in income taxes. Well, under President Trump's plan, we're gonna find that Social Security, the employee share, will stay at 6.2%, and that will continue to be wage capped. 
Uh, this year, that wage cap is one hundred twenty-two thousand. Excuse me, one hundred twenty-seven thousand two hundred dollars. Which means, if you make more in income over one hundred twenty-seven thousand two hundred dollars, you're no longer getting taxed on that for Social Security. So actually, your rate comes down. This is a regressive tax. In other words, people that make below one hundred twenty-seven thousand two hundred dollars pay a higher tax rate than those that make over that amount of money because of the regressive effect of Social Security. Medicare will stay at 1.45% and it has no cap, so whatever you earn, that's what you pay. Uh, we assume that the employee high income additional Medicare will stay at 0.9%. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, for Congress's plan, again, Social Security stays, Medicare stays, and the employee high income, we assume, stays as well since it's not addressed in the plan. Now, looking at individual tax filings, which is not, again, addressed in either one of the plans, we have to assume under President Trump's plan that we will still have quarterly as well as annual tax filings. Uh, and under Congress's plan, also not addressed, so we'll assume that those will stay as they are today. And you can see down there with my uh, little caricature of the best guest tax service, that $149 is what Americans paid on the average in 2015 to have someone best guess their taxes for them. That $149 represents an indirect tax. It's a tax on you because you are not able to be able to take an incomprehensible code and figure it out for yourself. You have to pay someone to do it, and many times they don't get it right either, as test after test has proven, and that may cause you a penalty in the future, or it may penalize the government in the sense that uh, not enough taxes were actually co uh, collected. Now, let's look at President and Congress's tax reform plans from a business perspective. Uh, President Trump, he wants to have a corporate tax of 15%. Uh, pass through business income. He hasn't said specifically how he would do that. What is pass through business income? This is typically uh, something that small corporations like an S Corp and LLC partnerships, rather than paying a separate corporate tax and then paying themselves and paying income taxes on whatever they receive, they just allow their profits to pass through and they take their business profits and include it into their personal income taxes. And that's what we call pass-through business income. So that's uh, yet to be determined. Let me close that right now. <clears throat> Then we got existing foreign uh, earnings repatriation. Uh, we know about uh, tax inversions have been going on where companies have been moving their headquarters overseas in order to avoid paying taxes. Well, President Trump has said any money you made overseas and you're keeping over there right now, if you bring it back to the United States, instead of charging up to 35% corporate tax today, we'll only tax you at 10%. Uh, one of the things they've done too, I think it's fairly smart, we'll see this in Congress's plan, is expensing. Uh, under the Trump plan, you'll have full expensing, or you can do deduction of interest paid. Now, what that means is, unlike today, where a company goes and buys a new piece of equipment, rather than taking a depreciation schedule for tax deduction on that, under the Trump plan, as we'll see under the congressional plan too, you can fully expense that. So you can fully expense or, or deduct the full amount of the item. Uh, and what that does then is, is it frees up money that the business then can use in order to be able to continue invest in their company. Uh, it adds capital so that they can uh, continue to grow it. So it's actually a good idea uh, as far as that business tax goes. Other business deductions and credits under the Trump plan, most are repealed except for research and development, which I, I think makes sense. Employer-provided daycare, this is something that seemed to be important enough to put into his plan that we included here. Uh, that would be capped. This would be building a facility or contracting for services for uh, daycare to be provided to the employees. Uh, it'll be capped under his plan at $500,000 with a five-year recapture. Today, it's only $150,000 with a 10-year recapture. And this is very important. The corporate alternative minimum tax would be repealed. Other things under the business taxes, uh, just like with the individual, uh, the employer share of payroll taxes will remain and will have Social Security continue to be capped at 62% uh, for the employer, Medicare, no cap. So wherever they pay out, 
uh, to the employee, then they own, uh, owe 1.45 percent of that to Medicare. Uh, for the self-employed individual, uh, you have the same thing, but you have both the employee and the employer share. So you've got the 12.4 percent Social Security cap, Medicare no cap, 2.9 percent, and you could potentially have high income uh, still today under Medicare, which could add on another 0.9 uh, percent. Congress's plan for businesses, corporate taxes are saying uh, a 20 percent rate. Pass-through income, they would uh, minimize that down to 25 percent as opposed to the higher rate of 33 percent. And this is done in order really to provide expensing of yourself, of what you as the business owner put into your business, so they reduce the tax rate there to 25 percent maximum. Uh, tangible and intangible export taxes, there would be a 0% corporate tax. Now, this is the one thing that Congressman Ryan <clears throat> and uh, Congressman Brady have been out there really extolling to every group that they can get in front of, is this thing that they call their border-adjusted tax. And what this means is, is that anything that a company produces in this country, if it gets shipped overseas, then when it's shipped overseas, whatever amount that represents for profit back to the company, it has a 0% tax, corporate tax on it. However, anything that remains in this country in terms of the product they produce uh, that gets uh, sold in this country, then that profit essentially has a 20% uh, corporate tax on it. So this is how they're doing a border adjusted tax. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, here in a few minutes. Investment write-offs excluding land, just like under the Trump plan, you'd still have full and immediate expensing. Uh, net operating losses can be carried forward indefinitely if you have losses in your business. There will be inflation adjusted, but they'll be limited to what you can count as a loss, up to 90% of whatever net taxable amount you have, but you can't carry it back to previous years. Uh, your net uh, or your interest expense can be deductible from your interest income, and net interest expense can be carried forward indefinitely. Uh, however, when we're looking at banking or banks and other financial institutions, uh, that is yet to be determined. Uh, some additional information about Congress's plan, the future foreign subsidiary earnings repatriation, 0% territorial. This is what we call the territorial tax. It's a, kind of a part of this, this whole bad thing too. And what they're saying here is that unlike today, whenever a company, if they have uh, an American company overseas, whenever they have earnings overseas, and if they repatriate it back to this country, then they have to pay the corporate tax on it. What we're saying here is companies in the future, if they produce anything overseas and they make a profit, they send it back to the states, there'll be no tax on it. Uh, the reason being is that we would like for that money to come back from overseas, uh, be put into our financial institutions where it can be reinvested in businesses uh, here, or maybe by the uh, reinvested by the company uh, that actually earned it overseas, but put in one of their companies here. Now, this existing foreign earnings repatriation, this means that uh, where Trump had 10%, uh, Congress is saying 8.75% for cash and equivalent, 3.5% uh, for others. And this is things or, or money that's being held overseas right now before the new tax uh, law went into effect. If you send that back after we put this law in effect, then we're only going to charge 8.75% or 3.5%. Uh, one of the things, too, is most international tax rules will be eliminated. This is subpart F to uh, subtitle A of the Internal Revenue Code, a very complicated part of our tax code. Uh, but a lot of that would be eliminated, and it's eliminated really consequential to the foreign subsidiary earnings we talked about up there above at 0% and the lower corporate tax rate to where this really may not have an impact on how people keep their money overseas and, and invest in, in foreign corporations, so to speak. Corporate alternative minimum tax will be repealed too under Congress's plan. How about payroll taxes under Congress's plan? We still got the Social Security. We still got the employer share of uh, Medicare. 
For the self-employed, again, uh, they're going to have to cover it all under Congress's plan as well, just like what we saw under the Trump plan. Now, how about authority and administration? Under the President's Trump plan, the 16th Amendment will continue to be required in order to be able to have the full extent of income taxes that he desires, and he also intends to keep the IRS. Congress also requires the 16th Amendment, and they have also said the IRS is going to stay, although they look to make it more friendly and more customer-oriented, and you can read more about that in the Better Way Plan that Congress put out for tax reform. Here is that 16th Amendment. I'll bring this up very quickly because these 30 words in our Constitution as amended should be very much in concern, a concern to you. Those 30 words, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. What does that mean? Those very ambiguous words means that Congress can tax you at whatever rate they want, uh, as much as they want, as often as they want. They don't need to tax that one income one time. They can tax that same income as many times as they like. Uh, and then the other thing, too, is what form can they take in, form, uh, in terms of payment uh, for the income taxes that you may have due? One of the things I'll point out with respect to this is back in 1999, uh, now President Trump, then Mr. Trump, thinking about running in 2000 uh, for president, one of the things he proposed was a 14.25% one-time tax, not just on financial assets. He said all assets of individuals with more than $10 million in wealth. And what he was trying to do was do a one-time uh, um, tax levy, if you will, was his proposal in order to uh, get rid of some of the debt we had. But the debt we had then was uh, almost a quarter of what we have in terms of debt now. And this is kind of what we saw in Greece back a couple of years ago, where they went in and they seized 10% of the people's uh, bank accounts in order to be able to start paying for some of the debts of the nation. So this 16th Amendment is a great concern, and the fact that it has to remain under Trump and Congress's plan is one that we should all really watch closely. Now, looking at some interim conclusions I have specific to what we just saw on the president's plan and on Congress's plan is this. One, the president's and Congress's income-based tax plans reflect a similar discriminatory, economically obstructive tax system that's been in effect since 1913. How's it discriminatory? Because it charges different rates for different people, and different people can get different types of credits and deductions that are not allowed to everyone. So it's discriminating. It's economically obstructive, not by my words, but by the words of the very experts' opinion that was put into Congress's plan. Both plans fail to adequately close avenues that would obstruct the reintroduction of 400-plus annual changes the code undergoes today. With every new Congress, there's approximately 1,000 changes to the tax code, approximately 400-plus every year. And I can assure you, with any new income tax code, just like we saw after President Reagan, who only had two rates, a 15% rate and a 28% rate, that before the ink has dried on any new income tax code, those 400 plus changes will have begun again in earnest. Both plans continue to present multiple tax consequences on the same income to corporate taxes or corporate investors. Why? Because there's a corporate tax first on the income from the company. Whatever's left over is left, goes to dividends and capital gains for the investor, which they have to themselves pay taxes on. So it's still a multiple tax uh, to investors. Both plans continue to impose dual taxation on the same income withheld from employees for the self-employed for payroll taxes and the self-employed for payroll taxes. Most people don't realize this, but the money that's taken out of your paycheck for payroll taxes, you also pay income tax on that because it is not deductible and that will continue under Trump's and Congress's plan. Both plans penalize productivity. Why? Because the more you make, the more productive you are, the more you're penalized, the more tax you pay. It incentivizes non-productivity, particularly through EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit. 
obstructs savings and investments, and indirectly subsidizes foreign corporations, particularly with the complexity of the code that we have, uh, and specifically, too, with the embedding of some taxes that will remain in there, as well as the corporate tax system we continue to have today that foreign companies don't have to, to deal with. Congress's plan to use an income base uh, tax as a VAT. Now, I'm not saying VAT as in Victor uh, Alpha Tango, uh, which is a value-added tax. This is that border-adjusted tax. And the one Congress plans to use is inconsistent with the World Trade Organization's acceptance of consumption-based taxes for border adjustments. Typically, the World Trade Organization does not allow for the use of income-based taxes, which they consider all of them to be a direct tax, uh, to be used as a border-adjusted tax. So Congress may have a problem passing uh, the muster for the WTO on their proposal. And both plans ignore the expert advice included in Congress's blueprint that income and corporate taxes are inferior to consumption-based taxes. So they're really going against uh, their own words in introducing, again, another income uh, and corporate tax system, which will also include payroll taxes. Now let's turn quickly to the fair tax. The fair tax uh, was introduced to the 115th Congress in bills uh, H.R. 25, meaning House of Representatives, and in the Senate, these is what we call companion legislation. They're identical bills, and that Senate number is S-18. They were introduced in the House by Representative Wad Rob Woodall uh, of Congressional District 7 in Georgia, and then uh, Senator Jerry Moran, again, of Kansas. Uh, and as of uh, tonight, we have 38 co-sponsors in the House, and we have four co-sponsors in the Senate. Uh, this happens to be, I believe, the 10th Congress, starting with the 106th, uh, to which this bill has been introduced uh, into Congress. The fair tax is just a 131-page bill. It's designed to replace most of the Internal Revenue Code, uh, parts A, or subtitles A, B, C, and H, and also most of the supporting rules and regulations, which combined with the code today is uh, thought to be over 78 thousand pages. If we stack that up, standard copy paper would be over 13 feet tall. Whereas the bill itself, HR 25, just 131 pages, you hold it in your hand, you can read it uh, in under an hour because the real meat of it's only about 40 to 50 pages. So what is the fair tax? Well, the fair tax is a retail sales tax that replaces all federal income, payroll, capital gains, estate, gift, alternative minimum, and corporate taxes. All those taxes uh, that uh, would be replaced or continue under the Trump or Congressional plan, they're gone. The sales tax will be assessed at retail on new products and any product not previously taxed. Uh, some cases where it not be, may not be previously taxed was where it was used in a business or a charity, had no tax on it. So if it's sold to a private consumer after being used in that capacity, then you would pay a tax on it at fair market value. And the tax will be also assessed on most all services. The sales tax will not be assessed on used products, those products that you've purchased today and used in the private, uh, and you use privately and have been used in the business or after. We lost your voice, Kerry. Kerry, we've lost your sound. Okay, if anybody has a magic wand, you can turn Kerry's sound back on. Let's see if maybe he muted himself. No. Uh, what is the fair tax? Uh, okay, we'll do. Bye. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll just stand by for a moment, for some reason, unexplained, Kerry's computer decided to do an automatic restart. So he is now waiting for it to boot back up. Uh, he will log back into uh, the Fairtax or the webinar system and be with us in just a moment. Meanwhile, if you've got any questions that uh, possibly I can answer for you, we'll take a look. Uh, that is one here from Mr. Ken. And Ken is asking, <laughs> Ken, Ken's crying, Mayday. Uh, okay, we've got your call, Ken. Are you over water or land? <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Uh, let's see what else we might have here. Nothing else thus far. All righty. Well, if you have any questions, you can type them in, or if you uh, have a microphone or a telephone that you're on, you can click the open hand in your control box, and I'll take a look for that and see if I can help you out. Okay, another question. Uh, Kerry, uh, Kevin, uh, Kenneth, rather, is now asking, will it ever pass? Yes, it will, Ken. Uh, and we can do it, if we, we've got to do it within this sh short window of opportunity we have now, which is the next four to six months, but it's going to take a grassroots effort, and I'm talking about a monumental effort. We need to, uh, by we I mean you and I and the other listeners on this webinar, need to get smart enough with the fair tax and comfortable enough with it to be able to talk about it with other people and get others to see the benefits, not only to themselves as individuals, but to the nation as a whole, which is really more important, especially if they are interested in how America is going to treat their children and grandchildren and so on. Because if we leave them strapped with another income tax, it's not gonna be a lot of fun for them. Uh, however, if we can get the fair tax passed, then we've got a chance, they will have a chance to live a decent life and uh, not have the IRS and a tax system be such a burden that uh, they're making it just from payday to payday. Um, let's see, I got a couple more questions that popped up here. We, uh, can we find these screens again later? I missed taking a picture of a few. Yes, uh, Don, the, uh, the session is being recorded and it will, within a week or so, be posted on uh, our Fair Tax, Florida Fair Tax Educational Association uh, YouTube channel. It will also be posted on the fairtax.org YouTube channel. And uh, once once it's posted, I can give you a link right directly to those uh, channel addresses. Uh, Attilio, if I said that right, if I didn't, I'm sorry, my apologies. How much would the retail SAG tax be? The tax is going to be 23 cents out of the dollar, uh, which is 23%. And the price tag that you see on the shelf or on the wall in the store will be inclusive of the fair tax. But please recall that before the fair tax is actually added, all of the embedded taxes that we do not see today go away. So the research found we've got embedded taxes of 20 to 20, almost 26%. Those taxes go away because the income tax system is going away, and then the fair tax gets added. So the cost of goods and services through the supply chain is reduced considerably, and then the fair tax is added. And I think Kerry's coming back up with us here. Uh, Kerry, are you with me? Not yet. Okay, my screen changed, so I thought Kerry was there. Uh, so that's 23 cents out of the dollar, uh, Atelio. Let's see, David is asking or saying, it may be that Windows is pushing out an upgrade. My computer flashed a message that it needed to shut down and I managed to stop it just in time. Very possible. Uh, Microsoft is not very considerate when it comes to doing their upgrades. And uh, the only shot we have is to uh, set them up so that they schedule to do it at some hour other than when we might be on the air. No, I mean on the computer at all for that matter. Uh, I tell you again, how much would the fair tax rise? How much does our income tax rise? Congress, according to the Constitution, not the 16th Amendment now, 
Uh, but uh, Article 1, Section 8 has the power to uh, lay and collect taxes. Uh, it defines everything except an income tax. The 16th Amendment does that. So they can raise the tax at their will uh, if they can get enough uh, congressional support to pass a tax increase, just like they can today. So we are at no disadvantage with a fair tax from uh, what we have under the income tax. And Wally is saying, has there been a campaign for all to share the fair tax websites with their email contacts across the country? Possibly not in those words, Wally, but there's certainly enough of us who have been advocating for the fair tax uh, eight, ten years or more, and everybody we talk to, we try to encourage them to uh, one, one, understand the fair tax, because we believe if they understand it, they'll demand it, and then to share their knowledge with others. Uh, the problem most people have is they know enough about it to be excited for themselves, but they don't know enough about it to be able to pass the information on and handle questions that they might be asked. They're afraid of the questions. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we do the webinars, and while I'm speaking about that, I am looking for other people who would be willing to do webinar presentations on other evenings of the month. Uh, the, the, the fourth Thursday has uh, been de you know, designed to be done by Mark Maneri, and in cases like now when Mark is out of town, out of the country in fact, uh, we'll find somebody to do a substitute like Kerry is doing tonight. But uh, I'd like to find somebody to do, for example, a Tuesday in the first week and a Wednesday in the second week, and uh, you know maybe a uh, a Friday in the fourth week. We'll probably avoid Friday because a lot of people are, are out on those days. But also like to get some done at a later time of the day. These are all done Eastern time. Makes it very difficult for the folks out on the West who are two or three hours behind us. And I'd like to get somebody who would be willing to do a presentation during those times. So, Kerry, are you back yet? I do not see you logged in. He's not back yet. Okay, uh, so that's the answer to your question, Wally. Thank you. Uh, next is Don. I share every fair tax post that I see on my Facebook feed to my timeline. Each of us can do that as well as many other things. You're absolutely right, Don. Uh, I do likewise, as uh, most of the others who have been around a while. And we can also put them out as Twitter feeds. And you can always, if there's a Facebook post, you can always put that link into a Twitter feed, a Twitter message and uh, say something brief enough so that you don't exceed the 140 characters and send that out to those that are following you on Twitter. Uh, let's see. Uh, Randy is adding, let's see, might help to mention signing up for the Fair Tax Friday newsletter. Very good. Uh, thank you, Randy. <clears throat> if you are not receiving the Friday Fair Tax Newsletter. That's because you have not registered with Americans for Fair Taxation. Now, to do that, you can go to bigsolutions.com and register there, or you can go directly to fairtax.org and register there. Either way, you're going to end up if, if you're at the fairtax.org because that is the residence for all of the papers that are support the fair tax. So if you're looking for any kind of knowledge, go to fairtax.org, and you can read some of the uh, the, the more common uh, bits of information that are high under the How It Works tab. And if you want to get into more of the detail, you can go to the Research tab and see the research papers that have been put out by the professors of economics that did this research for Americans for Fair, fair Taxation, as well as by uh, Karen Walby, who is our director of research, and uh, she is a, also a PhD in e economics, and we sure appreciate that lady. Thanks again, Randy. All right, uh, Marvin is saying we can all contact our congressmen and ask them to get behind it. Absolutely, that's one of the things that we will be promoting later on in this evening if we get Kerry back here. And if we don't, I will certainly do that. But one of the one of the important things in developing grassroots power is for as many people as we can get to contact their congressperson and their two state senators 
asking, why haven't you co-sponsored uh, co the fair tax yet? Why are you settling for what has been bad for the country for the last 104 years? Let's get rid of the income tax system. And there is a, there is a list of bullets that I have that Kerry put together, and I've added a couple of items to it that uh, we can put out, and I can send that to you if you'll just send me an email. With, when I get your email address, I'll know that you know, you're know you on the fair tax here, and that uh, just ask me for the bullets to send to our representatives, and I will send that along to you, as well as a copy of the better plan uh, versus the people's plan that Kerry is speaking from tonight. Kerry, I think I hear you back in there. I am back, thank goodness. Okay. Uh, pick up. Let's see if we get our. Go let's see if we get our screen back up here again. I'm going to have to reopen that for us here real quick. And I apologize to everyone for that. I thought that we clicked the right thing to postpone that uh, document earlier, but we'll get back down to the right page here. Good job on answering the questions, there, Larry. Did you put? Did you click the button to show your screen? Uh, stand by. Let me uh, go ahead and bring this back up, and then we'll go back to there. Uh, show screen. Uh, right now, it's not giving me that access for some reason, Larry. Right. Well, maybe because see. we lost you. Ah, but I hear you. Okay, I've got to uh, appoint you as a presenter again, which I have just done. You're under Mark Maneri's name, but you're now on the air. And you just have okay. to click that show screen button again. Welcome, Mark. There you go. All right. Let's drop this out of the way here. See if we can get our other one back up. Got your desktop. All right. Got your PowerPoint. You got to uh, either go into slide mode or. <clears throat> what is the fair tax? All right, I think we're back in there. And again, I apologize, folks, for that dropping out on me. It's uh, one of those glitches uh, that we just uh, had an oversight of the restart time there. Uh, we've already been talking about each one of these uh, first two bullets here, and I appreciate everybody if you'd hang in a little bit longer this evening than what we had uh, uh, originally planned for so we can finish getting through. I need to move a little bar out of my way here if I can. And we've already talked about uh, what would be uh, eliminated under the fair tax. We talked about what will be taxed under the fair tax as far as new products or any product that hasn't been previously taxed. Uh, we talked about, uh, and we, I think we were just getting to the sales tax where it will not be assessed on. It would be not assessed on used products, uh, intermediate sales. This is a big one. There are no business-to-business -business taxes, so anytime a business purchases something for their business, they won't pay the tax on it. Uh, this then would be true for exports, so this makes this the perfect border-adjusted tax because there's no tax component anywhere in the business process. The only time that an item is going to be taxed is when it's sold at retail. So when a product is made in this country and sold at retail or whether it comes from overseas and imported in this country, they're going to have the same tax consequence there at the register. It will also not be assessed on qualifying educational and vocational training services. Why? Because those are investments in America so people can make more money and actually pay more taxes in the long run. And it will also not be uh, assessed on qualifying not-for-profit organization purchases, much like what the states do today. The tax rate proposed under the fair tax is 23% inclusive, 30% exclusive. Why do we say inclusive and exclusive? Most of us are used to a sales tax. If we have a sales tax of 10%, that's exclusive. If it's a dollar and we add 10 cents to it, that makes it exclusive. Under the fair tax, we tend to talk a lot of times in terms of inclusive. And I gave an example. Let's say we had a product that cost 77 cents. We add 23 cents to it. That's actually a 30% tax because if we take that uh, 77 divided by that 23, we find that that ends up being 30%. But when we add the tax and the product together, 23 cents and 77 cents, that gives us a dollar. But when we take that 23 cents for tax and divide it by that total price of a dollar, it works out to be only 23%. Now, the sales tax funds all the funds that we have out there today where we have separate income and payroll and corporate taxes. We'll find that under the sales tax for every dollar of the sales tax, 65 cents goes to the general fund, 27 cents to Social Security, and 8 cents to Medicare. 
Uh, one of the things about sales taxes is that they're typically considered regressive in that those who make less money pay more than for the basic necessities of life, which are the housing, food, and medicine, than those that have uh, a greater amount of income. So in order to be able to uh, reduce or in some cases eliminate that regressive effect, we have something called the Family Consumption Allowance and Rebate. And what is the impact of this? Well, it eliminates taxes on taxable expenditures up to the poverty guidelines that are published annually by the Department of Health, uh, Health and Human Services. And it works very much like the standard deductions and exemptions work with income taxes. They essentially provide us enough in a standard deduction and exemptions to to eliminate paying income taxes up to the poverty guidelines. That's the same thing essentially we're doing with the family consumption allowance. However, the family consumption allowance to file for it is voluntary. And all you have to do is individuals and families that are legally residing in the U.S. can register annually with their state administering authority, which I'll talk more about in just a moment, the names and social security numbers of their family qualifying members to receive what's called a monthly rebate. Uh, as we'll find out here that the rebate is paid regardless of what your family's income is and has nothing to do with any amount that you purchase. All you have to have is the names of your family members, their social security numbers, you'll file annually for it, and you'll get uh, the rebate each month at the beginning of each month. And again, that's to basically untax you for the basic necessities of life and eliminate or reduce that regressive effect of a sales tax. And we'll see it'll be paid by a direct deposit or through a direct express card. Now, real quick, this is how it works. Larry, can you see that arrow on the screen there? I'm moving around. Yes, I can. If you, okay, if you look across, we have your qualified family size. I'm going to go over to where it says two adults married FCA, which is Family Consumption Allowance Guideline. And if we go from there down to where we find $32,480, well, what we're saying is, is that two adults and two persons, we'll say two children, so we have a four-member uh, household there, the guideline, and with the marriage penalty removed that the fair tax does for it, the guideline is $32,480. Now, what this is saying is that at $32,480, if you spent all of that amount of money on just taxable items, you would then uh, spend, if you look to the right, $7,470 of that would have been that 23% inclusive tax. If we divide that by 12 to see how much it could have been every month, it'd be $623. What we're saying then, when we're looking at this chart, and by the way, there's also a separate one for Alaska and Hawaii because of their very different, more expensive incomes. A four-member family, two adults and two children in this case, would get every month $623. If you're a single individual, if you look back up here at the top, a single individual would get $231. Uh, say a, a married couple that's on Social Security, they would get $462 every month. And again, this is to untax us for those basic necessities of life. And instead of waiting for a refund at the end of the year, you're going to be getting this every single month. Uh, Social Security. While we're on the Social Security, one of the very important things about this is that it's written into the legislation that there will be indexation inclusive of the sales tax so that whenever they go and they look, look at the breadbasket of items out there that they figure out the consumer price index from to determine whether or not if we need to increase the benefit amounts each year uh, for Social Security, it will include the sales tax so that they can make adjustments to increase benefits based upon that. So for those individuals on Social Security, you're going to have your Social Security index plus you're going to be receiving then uh, each month the rebate. Now, as far as business taxes go, essentially there are no business taxes when we're talking about the fair tax. Businesses will simply register with their state administering authority. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, there are no intermediate business business sales, as we talked about earlier, the hints, no businesses, uh, or no business taxes, based on my first comment up there. Uh, so there's no intermediate sales or business business taxes for businesses and government enterprises. Those are government agencies that operate very much like a commercial enterprise does. And I have another comment on that in just a moment. Retail businesses, those that are selling directly to the public, so to speak, they will collect the sales uh, tax from their sales to their customers, much like you see in the states today. 
Financial services will also collect taxes on exclusive and, and imputed fees. Uh, imputed fees would be like if you have a loan uh, through a bank, then you'll have a sales tax on the servicing of that loan, which will be uh, based upon what their percentage rate is uh, assigned to your loan. And if there's any exclusive fees, uh, say for investments, if you have an exclusive fee, you'll have a tax just on that service. But there's no taxes on the returns, the dividends, the interest, the capital gains. There's no taxes on, on any of that. Retail businesses then timely reporting and remitting taxes get to keep up to 0.25%, that's one quarter of a percent of collected taxes for their compliance. It reimburses businesses, something that is not done today when businesses have to do all the income tax computations and withholding for payroll and income taxes, as well as paying corporate taxes. Taxable employers pay sales taxes for services rendered by employees to the employer and also true for non-enterprise government entities. I'll talk more about the government here in just a second. What a taxable employer is, is let's say you're wealthy enough to have domestic servants. Those domestic servants are providing a service to you, but you also employ them. So you're both the employer and the final consumer of their services. So you become the taxable employer. You're responsible then for paying the tax on the service that they provide to you, which would be essentially 30% of whatever you pay them. Businesses will report employee income for Social Security benefits. The government will not be getting information under this legislation, as they do today, invasively getting into your life, uh, to find out what your income is. The only thing that has to be reported um, in terms of your income, the earned income that you make through your employer, is your income for Social Security credit accumulation. And it will will be the accumulation of those credits that will determine your subsequent benefits. And you need 40 of them over 10 years in order to be able to qualify for Social Security in the future. Now, tax exempted will be purchases, as I stated earlier, for qualifying not-for-profit organizations. Uh, employee services to not-for-profit organizations will also be tax exempted. Tuition for primary, secondary, and post-secondary education and vocational training will have no tax on it and employees providing direct education and training services will have no tax on their services. Again, we see this as an investment in America, and uh, by training and educating people, we're looking to have a big return on that in the future when they start buying things and paying taxes. Government tax obligations. I've been talking about coming back to governments. The sales tax is assessed on products and services purchased by any government entity that is not a government enterprise. The fair tax look at government's uh, uh, entities two different ways, non-enterprise uh, non and enterprise. Non-enterprise may be like the Department of Agriculture. Uh, a government enterprise, uh, it's a quasi-government enterprise, would be like uh, the post office. The post office uh, would charge you the sales tax when they sell you a stamp for the service then, essentially two, that they're providing to you. Uh, you're going to be paying the sales tax on that through the stamp. A uh, non-enterprise entity like the uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, that would be a, a, a non-enterprise entity. Uh, and as we'll see here in just a moment, what you'll find then is that the sales tax will be assessed on the payroll of all federal, state, and sub-political entity employees, excluding those government enterprises and employees providing direct educational services. So all the employees that are working with the Department of uh, Agriculture today the Department of Agriculture has to pay them enough in order to be able to cover their income taxes, their payroll taxes. Plus, we're going to find in each case, too, uh, that, uh, that the government has to also provide, in many cases, for uh, the payroll taxes as the employee of these individuals. As well as, we're going to find, too, that governments, when they make purchases of products and services today, they're paying the embedded taxes there's corporate taxes, income taxes that are already embedded in products and services. Well, all that goes away in the future, but still we have to uh, get that tax back in some way. And the way we do that is by making governments then taxable employers so that those employees that are working for a non-enterprise government agency, the payroll, not their individual incomes, but the payroll will be assessed the sales tax. And that's how we recapture that. So people have a, have a tough idea of how to comprehend that, but think of it this way. 
Let's say that uh, the state of North Carolina today made everybody a state employee. Everybody that worked in grocery, funeral homes, hospitals was a state employee. Then who in the state of North Carolina then would be paying a sales tax that would pay for the Department of Defense, all the infrastructure of the United States? In other words, the more people that you put into government and you take out of the private sector, the less people there are, the less businesses there are in private sector in order to be able to pay uh, for for the services that government provides for you, which would increase the amount of tax burden that would be placed on that private sector. So this is how we get away from that, and this does not interfere uh, with the concept of intergovernmental immunity. So government enterprises will collect the sales tax uh, from the sale of their respective products and services, as we talked about before, like the post office and any other entity, maybe public utilities uh, in your local district. Subsidies also provided to any government enterprise will be assessed the sales tax. And the reason for this is, is that someone in the private sector, let's say it has their own business, cannot go to get a loan and not be expected, uh, in this particular case, to have to pay some interest on that loan, which is going to cost them. Well, governments just giving uh, a government enterprise a subsidy is an unfair advantage to that government enterprise say giving it to the post office over giving a similar type of break to UPS or to FedEx. So any government subsidy will have a tax placed on it if it's given to a government enterprise. Now what about administration authority? The IRS under the fair tax will be defunded within three years and replaced with a small sales tax bureau and uh, we'll also see an excise tax bureau to, ex to uh, do those taxes that uh, are not taken care of by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms today. And there's where we talk about that. The sales tax will be offered to the states for administration and collection on a reimbursable basis. And any state that accepts uh, the responsibility of administering and collecting the taxes, this then gets to keep 0.25% of all taxes collected by the state. The state of Texas comptroller looked at this back a couple of years ago and found that that would be sufficient to be able to cover any additional cost to collect the federal tax in addition to the state tax. The federal government cannot force the state to collect the tax, but it can offer it up voluntarily, uh, and it just makes sense to do so, so you don't have a redundance of agencies and we can get rid of the IRS. Uh, then the agency within the state authorized to collect and administer the sales tax then becomes the administering authority. Or if you're a state that doesn't accept that authority, then the Secretary of the Treasury uh, will continue to do that through the Sales Tax Bureau. And then one of the very important things that we have, and it's the last on the last page of our legislation, is a sunset clause. And that what that sunset clause says that if the 16th Amendment is not repealed within the seven years from the date of enactment of the fair tax, then the fair tax and any subsequent amendments to the tax are repealed. This is a statement of confidence. It's a statement of confidence that we believe the people will like the fair tax so much that they will insist on getting the 16th repeal to forever eliminate the type of income taxation we have today get it repealed in order to keep the fair tax and not lose it under that sunset clause. So pay in your taxes under the fair tax for individuals that simply purchase a taxable product or service like we see down there at my little caricatures at the bottom. Go and buy something at the store or maybe have somebody come and do landscaping for you, provide you a retail service, simply pay it then. Uh, and then the only other thing you have to do is voluntarily register uh, each year for the family consumption allowance and you have to be a legal resident to do that. So if you're in our country illegally, uh, and you put that Social Security in or you don't have a Social Security number, then you're not going to receive the rebate. For businesses, it's simply as easy as registering with the State Administering Authority to receive the tax exempt purchasing authority. And retail businesses then will collect taxes from customers, report sales, and remit taxes. It's just that simple. Some interim conclusions. These match up with the interim conclusions I had with the, the uh, President's and Congress's plan. The fair tax makes a complete departure from the discriminatory and economically obstructive income-based tax system that's been in effect since 1913, a complete departure from it. The fair tax removes the avenues to again initiate the 400 plus annual tax code changes occurring today that directly support crony capitalism. 
without all the avenues open to be able to get in and have one business trying to get tax breaks uh, above and beyond what any other business can get. We eliminate those avenues and reducing or eliminating crony capitalism. The fair tax, void of corporate taxes and capital gains taxes, eliminates multiple tax consequences on the same income to corporate investors. The fair tax, void of income and payroll taxes, eliminates the double taxation on income withheld for payroll taxes. The fair tax thus incentivizes productivity. Why? Because unless you spend more, then you have more money to save. You get that second job to maybe pay to have your child go to school. Today, if you got that second job, you'd have to pay more taxes on that additional income. Plus, you probably would end up having to pay taxes on that education. All that goes away under the fair tax. It does not obstruct savings and investment, and it does not indirectly subsidize foreign corporations. It fully complies with World Trade Organization acceptance for the applications of border adjusted taxes and the fair tax, very importantly, the fair tax meets the speaker's directive, the task force on tax reform goals and expert opinion presented in Congress's tax reform blueprint. Now, obviously, ladies and gentlemen, those of you that know the, the fair tax well, I could have put hundreds of conclusions up here but I wanted to put these very specific ones of how they tie into what Congress has said, the President has said. Now, very quickly, we're almost done here. The seven features of an effective tax system, you can see them listed down there on the left-hand side. Is it simple? Is it fair? I don't like the word fair. In fact, I wish we had the freedom tax uh, or the fair tax renamed the freedom tax. Fair is a subjective word. It means different things to different people. It should be equitable. Equitable is something that's quantifiable, therefore we can justify it. Uh, and it makes a lot more sense when we're talking about taxation, eliminates discrimination. Is it visible? Do you really know how much tax you're paying uh, versus having it embedded in products and services? Is it neutral to business? Now there's two types of neutral you hear about there. Revenue neutral means does it collect the same amount of taxes as is collected today through the current income tax system? Many experts say the presidents will not. Congresses probably would. The fair tax, all indications are that it will collect and be revenue neutral. Now, business neutral means that, that the tax doesn't interfere with business decisions. And that's one of the big problems we have today is how much taxation interferes with what a business does in growing its business, whether it stays in the United States or go overseas. How efficient it is. How stable it is. Stable means how often do we expect it to be changed? And then what is the impact? Well, if we look at each one of those, we find that the president and the Congress does not meet what the fair tax can do in terms of simplicity. It is not fair. In other words, it's not as equitable, the president and the Congress, is, as is the fair tax. The fair tax, everyone pays the same rate for exactly the same thing. They get exactly the same family consumption allowance and rebate based on family size. Every business gets exactly the same tax break, i.e. no taxes. Therefore, every individual consumer gets the same uh, benefit of that lack of taxation. Which one's most visible? Still the president and Congresses, their taxes, corporate taxes, payroll taxes will be embedded uh, in the price of products that you buy. You won't see it. The fair tax, on the other hand, when you get a sales receipt, the bill says, has to tell you the percentage of the tax and how much that tax is uh, when it's included into the cost of your product. Which one's most business neutral? Obviously the fair tax is. Why? There's no corporate taxes, no business taxes at all. Which one is most efficient? The president and the Congress says, no, it's not most efficient. You're still going to have to go out there and file your taxes. We're still going to have an IRS that consumes $10 billion a year with 100,000 employees, whereas the fair tax is going to be administered mostly by the states. In fact, it even says in the Federalist Papers, one of the things Madison says, uh, anytime you're going to have a tax on the same article, don't, to the disgust of the people of the states, use two different agents. Use the same agent. In this case, we use the, the state tax agents. Which one's going to be the most stable? Obviously, it's going to be the fair tax because it's not going to have all those avenues open to get in and start introducing crony capitalism again. And... You know, economic impact, I don't have to say it. That's already been said in the Congress's own plan. Obviously, the fair tax as a consumption-based tax is going to have 
the greatest economic impact, the greatest economic growth, and the greatest opportunities for every individual and our nation and all of our businesses. The fair tax is not just a temporary better way, but is the best way forward for our nation now and into the future. Last couple of things. Uh, what I presented tonight, we have in a six-page brochure that you can either write me at uh, carry at RestoreAmericasBlessings.com, and I'll have these up again uh, during the rest of the question period, or you can write Larry there, repeal underscore uh, 16 at earthlink.net, and we can send this to you, and you've got all the information. One thing I want to point out that's in there is in addition to the seven uh, features of effective tax, I've got 51 other entities that are impacted by taxation where I've compared the House Ways and Means Plan with a fair tax to see which one comes out uh, the best. And you're going to find where, if you look on that page to the right, only estate taxes do they come anywhere close to being matched up. So how do we do on our presentation objectives? We've introduced the principal components of the Trump and Congress tax reform plans and the replacement plan of the people, the fair tax. We've looked at the seven tax effectiveness features and identified which one, uh, which tax reform or replacement measure best achieves each feature. And now we want to motivate you to engage the president and Congress to pursue implementation of a tax system that is not just better, ladies and gentlemen, but best for every American and the nation. Let's quit picking at that, that cancer we have in America that, that's a, it's called income taxes. Let's cut it out completely and eliminate it from our whole system and go with what's best for America. So here's what you can do. Learn more about the fair tax. Go to fairtax.org. Uh, I've got some other things. I'm going to leave this up. It'll come up here in just a moment. Listen to the Fair Tax Guys radio show. Contribute to the Fair Tax organization. Physically support the fair tax through individual and collective events. And by the way, big deal. This just uh, got announced this week. Uh, we're going to have a rally that's going to be in close proximity of the New York Trump Tower on the 15th of April. Those that are interested and want to participate in that rally to hopefully get the president's attention, as rallies typically do, close to the tower, and all of these are going to be very respectful rallies, as we normally do. Uh, contact Dave Corsi at that email address, uh, dcorsi31119 at gmail.com. Again, I'll put this back up in a moment. That's a very important event and something you can participate in. Write the president and Congress and tell them to support the fair tax. Use your mail. Use the Twitter, Facebook, phone, fax, everything that's at your disposal. Get the message to them that we want the fair tax, no more income taxes. But whatever you do, please do it now. Obviously, time is running out as Congress and the president gets closer to uh, coming up with a new tax plan. So fair tax, uh, with your help, we can make it happen. With Larry, uh, I think that's going to conclude right now. We'll see if there's any other questions in that, that folks may have uh, about the fair tax as well as the other plans that we've introduced tonight. Again, my apologies for the break and running over. Hopefully, we still have some folks there, and, uh, and we can answer your questions. Okay, Kerry, very good. Thank you very much. And uh, if you will click on one of the question marks to open the question panel on your screen. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think you can see from the organization and the detail of Kerry's presentation uh, that if, uh, if he had been in the cockpit of his F-16 when he lost control <laughs> of the system, we wouldn't have heard from him again. But uh, he put it together and finished up, even though we're a little bit later than planned. So, Kerry, if you've got your display up, uh, you can start answering the questions at will. Uh, one of the problems I have uh, right now is I'm just seeing maybe one line. It's not expanding for me. Is there a way to expand did, that? Did you, did you click the question mark so it opens this, the uh, window in the center of your screen? I've got the questions blocked hit. Uh, we're looking for the question mark. I'm not seeing question it right mark now. Next to, next to uh, Attilio has a question mark up, the second person on your list. Okay, let's go up there and see if we can find that then. Uh, I'm not actually seeing the full list for some reason. That's not, let me go back up here. Maybe this is it. Let's sure expand it. Here we possible. go. All right, there we go. We got it now. Uh, let's see. And we're looking for Mark Attilio. Uh, how much would the retail tax be? That would be 
thirty percent in terms of how you understand it today when you go and pay a state uh, retail sales tax. It would be thirty percent or twenty three percent inclusive uh, when we compare it to uh, income taxes. A lot of people don't understand income taxes are given to us in an inclusive uh, rate. Uh, but that I mean, if if you made a hundred dollars and that hundred dollars uh, fell into the twenty percent tax bracket, you would owe twenty dollars to the government for your income tax. That's the twenty percent inclusive rate. But if I take that twenty dollars and compare it to the eighty dollars, that's twenty five percent exclusive rate. So if you wanted to keep eighty dollars for the day, if you did a service for me, you'd have to charge me a hundred dollars, which would be twenty five uh, or twenty dollars of that would be tax. Uh, Actually, I think I confused that on you there a little bit, but the 25% would be the 20 uh, that we would find when we divided it, uh, or 80 divided by 20. So inclusive versus exclusive, how much is a retail tax? 30%. And again, that's for the general fund, Social Security, and your Medicare. Okay, Carrie, right? it looks like you've got the list that includes those questions I answered before, while you were on the little sabbatical. All right. uh, so maybe I'm going to have to... Uh, point you to a question or read the questions for you. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to take one here from Kenneth. Let's say it did pass. Does the people have to fill out any forms moving forward? No. If the fair tax were to pass, uh, and the way the fair tax would be set up, it would go into effect uh, on the 1st of January. Uh, if we were to pass that this year, it would go into effect on the 1st of January next year. I wouldn't anticipate it any earlier, though, than January 2019. You would have nothing to do other than to, once you receive your card from your state administering authority, notify them of the names and Social Security numbers of each individual in your family so you start receiving the family consumption allowance uh, as soon as the fair tax is enacted. enacted. Very good. Uh, Attilio would like you to respond. Please explain how it would affect low-income families. Uh, low-income families uh, would would have the same benefits, essentially, that they have today in the sense that uh, they're going to be receiving the family consumption allowance, plus they're going to have, uh, well, the family consumption allowance is the big thing for them, plus the mere fact that you can go and buy used items, which a lot of folks uh, that are, are having uh, some, some difficulty maybe with their income, uh, not as wealthy as others to be able to buy new products, they can go and buy used products, uh, in which case they would not be paying the tax on it, and that would help them. Also, they can go and get that second job or other members of the family get jobs and they would not have to pay the taxes on that additional income like you do today. They could save that. They could use that money for additional training and education in order to be able to get better jobs. So all in all, all around a much better situation for those of lower incomes today. Very good. And don't don't forget to tell you that everybody will be taking home a full paycheck. There will be no withholdings, no federal withholdings from your paycheck. The average worker today will realize an increase in take-home dollars of 29.28%. Okay. Uh, Randy, thank you. Uh, I, I mentioned bigsolutions.com earlier. I was in error. It is bigsolutions.org, O-R-G. Thanks, Randy. Uh, okay, Marvin is asking, we can all contact, or he's commenting, we can all contact our congressman and, and ask them to get behind it. Absolutely, Marv, thanks. Uh, Bob, correct website is bigsolutions.org. Okay, he's on top of Randy with that one. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we'll go to David. Uh, Dr. Sabula's new study calculates the income tax evasion in the U.S. has already reached 16% and is growing. Uh, rather than reading this entire thing, I will maybe, brand, uh, Carrie, you can share the, uh, the Dr. Sabulo research uh, study in just a few words. Well, the one thing that, uh, that I saw where there was a study done, I think it was up in Minnesota on sales tax, was that the sales tax rate uh, is, is very low in terms of evasion. Now, when we think about the income tax and just the complexity of the income tax, uh, not only is there evasion problems, but there's just problems in coming up with what is the exact amount of tax that is due. And in many cases, you're going to find that 
uh, the errors there can exist, and it's an inadvertent uh, escaping of paying taxes. The other thing we see, too, is under the current uh, tax system is that uh, we all see the commercials where you can get a good lawyer, you owe $100,000, they'll get you off for uh, 90, less than 90% of that or 10% of that. You might only have to pay $10,000. So we have a very complex system today, and because the IRS doesn't understand it too, uh, it presents problems where we go to court to be able to get people to actually pay what they need to or should be paying uh, in terms of the tax, uh, tax consequence. Now, one of the important things about avoiding tax evasion is that unlike today and under the proposed Trump and uh, Congress plan, they're going to have to have one agency overseeing approximately 165 million individual filers plus another 30 million approximate uh, number of businesses. Whereas under the fair tax, you eliminate the individual filers, so there's 165 million that disappear off the bat, and you've got approximately 30 million businesses. But instead of having one agency oversee and auditing those businesses, you've got 50 of them, one for each state. So you reduce the opportunity for tax evasion uh, by reducing the complexity of the organization and essentially increasing your oversight and the amount of oversight you have available per each taxpayer, which in this case uh, is really only the, um, uh, it's trying to restart on me again here, uh, which is really only uh, the individual is paying taxes and, and not the business. So. Uh, uh, I think overall you're going to find that the, the sales tax uh, will certainly help any tax evasion uh, or tax avoidance that we have going on today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, from Don, was there a purposeful shift in calling what has been labeled as a prebate to a rebate? And if so, why? Uh, prebate, <laughs> prebate is something that fair taxers came up with. And they they call it a prebate, uh, essentially because you can get that uh, even before you spend the money because it comes. It has to be uh, put in your account on or before the first of the month. Uh, and so they call it a prebate. Rebate, R-E-B-A-T, is the term used in the legislation. Uh, rebate, too, is kind of a confusing term because most of us think we have to buy something in order to get a rebate. But it's not true. Uh, you don't have to pay anything, and you're still going to get the rebate as long as uh, you've registered for the uh, family consumption allowance. Yes, it's actually family consumption allowance then, isn't it? And the prebate was a tag that we put on it to uh, not have to say family consumption allowance. Well, it, it's really the rebate. Uh, the rebate is the payment portion of the allowance. Let's put it but, that way. But it's a prebate. It's in advance, right? Well, it, it's still... It still works the same way. Prebate is a word made up by fair taxers. It is not right. a word anywhere in the legislation. Right. In the right. legislation, it's only called rebate, just to right. make sure people understand. All right. And uh, Wally is asking, what are the transition issues regarding existing business inventory, such as that already taxed? Good question. Uh, yeah. It is a very good question. What you're going to find is all your business inventory and any work in progress. This is specifically in the legislation. Uh, what will happen on that is essentially you'll be able to put it out on the shelf. It's already considered to be taxed, and you'll be able to file for a credit for that uh, since it has been taxed. And that is explained in, uh, in, in good detail within the legislation itself. So that's already been taxed, uh, so there won't be a further tax on it. Very good. All right. Uh, oh, Ken said bedtime. Good night. And he's passing a smile along. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, Bob said, we heard from a fair tax power radio listener who went to Big Solutions, and it was not correct. He asked us to be sure we made it clear that it's bigsolution.org. I guess I got that right now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, how is the how is the fair tax different from the VAT used in Europe? Uh, the VAT is something that can be added to every stage of production, uh, and then the consumer pays for it. It is a consumption-based tax. Uh, so eventually, whoever buys something at retail will pay that VAT. But in Europe, the way they treat the VAT uh, for a border-adjusted tax is whenever they ship a product overseas, the VAT is not included. 
uh, which is something we don't have the capability to do under an income tax, uh, although Congress wants to try to do it with the border adjusted tax that they've come up with. Whereas the fair tax uh, is, is a tax on everything, and, and it only occurs one time. It doesn't occur in every stage of production. It's like any sales tax. It's only added uh, at that last and final sale to a uh, private uh, consumer, uh, if you will, of a product or service. And since we have no taxes in the production of products or services uh, in the United States, then we export stuff overseas without the sales tax and any tax included in it. So, uh, you know, you can have in terms of exports the same kind of an impact. But when you're talking about a VAT, and this is one thing we want to be very careful of, I'm using the word VAT for value-added tax. We do not want that in the United States. I have a feeling Congress is going to try to push it on us because what you'll end up with is both income taxes, payroll taxes, corporate taxes, and a VAT. So uh, something we don't want, uh, and I hope that explained the difference between the two. Okay, and has the fair tax been tried in any other country? Wow. No, it has not been tried uh, to the extent that, uh, that we are addressing here. Uh, Shelly Ann Tomlinson did a paper, her graduate research paper from the University of Georgia uh, Law School back several years ago, and she looked at a couple of nations that came close, but none have approached anything like what we're talking about here with the fair tax. And if the truth be known, the last thing we want in America is to have some other country implement a fair tax program because then they will become the vacuum for business headquarters and for investment capital and we will be uh, we will be in the swamp for sure that's right one of the things to point out on that too it's very important especially when we're talking about uh, tax inversions and businesses going overseas uh, one of the studies that was put out by the international monetary uh, fund through the bank of international settlements back in 2009 uh, they were looking at how much money is in offshore and cross-borders uh, financial institutions. And that amount in 2009 was over $32 trillion, uh, a, a part of that uh, only in the United States. But the two most important things that they identified in order to be able to attract money from overseas into your own financial institutions, number one was not taxes, but was the security of your law and uh, how well you abide by international law. The second part was taxation. So the United States being one of the best in terms of compliance with international and domestic law, plus having under the fair tax the best tax system, the net 32 trillion plus dollars out there today, I would expect to see a lot of that come into our banks, up our money supply, decrease our interest uh, uh, rates then for loans in order to be able to have more economic growth and growth of jobs and industry. Okay, it uh, looks like, let's see. Oh, could you put the two emails back up on the screen for people to copy? That's from Robert. Uh, the VAT in Europe encourages evasion on services. It's about 25%. That's from Attilio. Thanks, Attilio. Uh, Randy says, good night. Good job. Are any other states besides Georgia that has a fair tax bill introduced? From Marvin. Uh, I, you know, I, I follow the fair tax traffic on that. Uh, I know the folks in Oklahoma were looking at something. Kansas was. North Carolina is. Georgia is. Uh, one of the northern states a while back was talking about maybe looking in that direction, too. Uh, none of them have exactly the fair tax. Some are looking at going to that. But I'm blessed to live in a state, as are you, Larry, that doesn't have income taxes. We have a sales tax. Uh, what we don't have is we don't have the family consumption allowance. Uh, what we do have is in some cases there may be some uh, uh, corporate taxes. As Nevada came up with this first one here a couple of years ago. Uh, but none have actually adopted an exact fair tax measure. However, if they did, it's going to make it very easy on them when we go to the fair tax at the federal level because their compliance, uh, I, I should say the administration collection compliance would all be exactly the same. Uh, and uh, so it would really benefit uh, states to start moving in that direction. Right. Okay, that should wrap it up. Uh, there's a couple of comments here, some kudos and whatnot. I'll save the time since we are running so so much overtime. We're uh, 35 minutes over our allotted time. 
And if you have, have your window up there with the uh, email addresses on it, you can email Kerry any questions he'll be happy to answer, I know, and you can do the same with me. You've got both of our email addresses there. I thank you very much for attending, and Kerry, once again, thank you very much for taking the time out to update your presentation and make it available to us. And uh, I, I think you've given everybody something that they did not know before, and that's, that's great. And if we can... Uh, continue to improve the knowledge base of the fair tax advocates, I know that we can have a successful grassroots uh, momentum and get this thing passed, and at least get it to the floor for an open, objective discussion. Kerry, it's uh, up to you from here. Well, thank you very much, Larry, and I thank everybody for attending, and I apologize again for being computer challenged tonight and, and losing the time that we did. Uh, a very important message. Please, everyone, get in touch with the president, get in touch with Congress. No more income taxes. We'll just end up where we are today if we allow another uh, massaged income tax to come into play. Fair tax is the best answer for the individual, uh, our states, and our nation. And again, thank you all. Very good. Have a good night, everyone.